Measuring time in a portable way, let's make it happen. In the old days, people used to measure time using the standard C time function. Put something like this. You include the C time header. You measure the start of the benchmark. And then the end. Seconds and line. And that's how it worked. We run this two seconds execution time. That's the old days. Now, what's wrong with the scope? Well, it has some pretty major drawbacks. First, the accuracy is pretty bad. It uses seconds instead of milliseconds or even nanoseconds, so you need to work on a very high sample or have a very long running algorithm to actually measure anything meaningful. You really have no control over it. You only have the single time function and that's it. You can't configure anything else. And the function itself isn't really well defined. You see it usually returns seconds but it's not really standardized anywhere. Okay, so let's get rid of the old approach and try to make something better. Let's get rid of this and this. So, let's make a class which will measure the execution time of a single block. This implies we should tie a timer object to a scope. So let's start by making a class called execution timer. Public. Let's first make it an empty skeleton structure and structure, and that's it. And we will make our object here. This timer object should measure the time taken to execute this whole block. In our case, it will be pretty much the sorting algorithm. We can use the new chrono header and take advantage of standardized timers there. The standard library offers us three types of clocks system clock, steady clock, and the high resolution clock. Let's see which one to use. First, maybe let's get rid of this default constructor because it, will, because it actually won't be needed. Let's measure the starting time point. First, let's use a system clock. Start. System clock now. And in our destructor, let's just print it out. Here we need to use the count method because subtracting two time points gives us something called a duration. And duration isn't representable as a string. You should use the count method to get the actual time point difference between the two starting and ending time points of the duration. Okay, so we have our skeleton which uses a system clock and let's see if it works. Well, not exactly. We have some numbers, some count, we, we, but we don't actually know what this number represents. And that's where a duration ca cast com comes in. A duration cast changes the duration from some unknown specialization to a specialization of our choosing. For example, if you want to measure the time in milliseconds, 
we should cast this home duration to a standard millisecond duration. Here we use the millisecond duration, we use the duration cast. So now we know that this represents millisecond and count returns the millisecond count of the duration which in fact means milliseconds between the starting and ending time point. So let's see. 2107 milliseconds. So is that all? Well, not exactly. You see, the system clock is really a very bad choice for measuring time. A system clock is not steady which means it can change at any time to any value, which implies that your duration might actually be negative if the system clock goes backwards. It can be skewed because the system clock can go ages forwards, so it's not really reliable for measuring the execution time. So what we need is something called a steady clock. A steady clock is guaranteed to go only forwards and not be adjusted by any external means. So let's see how to change it. Let's make an alias. So we won't repeat ourselves. Let's use steady clock. And here let's just substitute this whole mess. Over clock alias. Okay, that's better. Let's see if it works. Of course it works. So, is that all? No. We now have a clock which is steady, which is good, but we really don't know what is the accuracy of this clock. It might may as well be seconds, like in the standard C time function, which is really, really bad. Fortunately, the standard library gives us the third clock type, the high resolution clock. But there's a minor drawback. The high resolution clock isn't guaranteed to be steady. So what to do? Fortunately, we can use a little bit of metaprogramming to choose between the two clocks. Each clock has a is steady static bool member, which tells us if it's really steady or not. So based on this member, we can really choose either a high resolution clock or a steady clock as a fallback. So let's use a standard conditional T. And now, first, let's see why if our high resolution clock is steady. If so, let's just use it. Otherwise, let's just use a steady clock, which might have worse ac accuracy. So now, our clock is either a high resolution clock or a steady clock. Seems like we're done. Are we? Let's check if it works. It seems to work. We really don't know which one is chosen. But it doesn't really matter. So that's our execution timer, a really basic execution timer which is tied to the scope. But we can make it a little bit more configurable. Let's suppose we wish to configure the default duration or default accuracy, which is used here in the duration cast to get the accuracy we really need. So let's make it a template resolution and by default let's use milliseconds and supply resolution here and let's see what the difference is our first timer will use the default resolution of milliseconds our second timer will use let's say seconds 
and let's see the difference. And there you go. We have our generic, configurable, benchmarking or execution timer. Okay, hope you found this informative. If you like to see more tutorials, more how-tos, click up subscribe, give thumbs up and see you later.